Hi, everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, welcome to the Museum of the City of New York. My name is Fran Rosenfeld. I'm the Director of Public Programs at the Museum. Thanks so much uh, for joining us this afternoon for the first session in our Vibe of the Village Festival. Our first session is called Capturing the Vibe, Photojournalists and the Voice. Um, for today's panel, we're thrilled to be joined by a distinguished group of influential photojournalists, all of whom documented the city for The Voice. They're going to share their experiences working at the iconic publication, in some cases directly with Fred McDara. And we're going to be joined shortly by Amy Arbus, James Hamilton, Sylvia Placci, and Harvey Wang, plus our moderator, longtime voice art critic Vince Saletti. Um, they will share their experiences working for The Voice and capturing the city, um, and you'll hear about more about them in just a minute. I just first want to tell you, if you don't know, that you're at the Vibe of the Village Festival, which is a weekend-long festival uh, that the museum is producing. It started last night. It's continuing throughout today and into tomorrow. And we are celebrating this weekend the remarkable creative legacy of the late, great Village Voice, the downtown Newsweekly that, quote, gave New York its cool um, by chronicling the city's arts, culture, counterculture, politics, and beyond. And as well, The Voice nurtured several generations of influential American photojournalists, critics, and writers. And the next, this panel and the next one, which takes place at 3 o'clock um, and is dedicated to, uh, is a conversation about vo uh, Village Voice writers, really is looking at the people who worked behind the scenes at The Voice. I would like to invite you to stay for the second panel at 3 p.m. as well, which is New York's Magic Mirror, Writers and The Voice. Uh, there are still tickets available, and we'll be, um, ha we'll be joined by um, Susan Brownmiller, Guy Trebay, Greg Tate, um, and Richard Goldstein, and our moderator is Ada Calhoun, so please stick around for that. I also invite you to check out other things going on in the museum this weekend as part of the vibe of the Village Festival. Uh, in addition to, we have a poetry hour tonight curated by the Poetry Project, whose home base is St. Mark's Church. We have live music, a maker's market. We've got um, guided tours of the Fred McDara Gallery. And tonight at 8 p.m., we have a, a concert, Voices of the Village, with David Amram and friends. Um, the friends include his quintet, uh, Leia Delaria, Martha Redbone, Paquito de Rivera, and Tom Chapin. So again, if you're interested in coming tonight, we still have tickets available and would love to have you. Um, so I think as most people know that this festival, and this certainly this panel, uh, is presented in conjunction with the museum's current exhibition, The Voice of the Village, Fred W. McDara Photographs, which examines New York City from the late 50s through the 70s, through the lens of the Village Voice's longtime staff photographer, Fred W. McDara. Um, and this exhibition was curated by uh, my colleague, Sean Corcoran, who's here with us uh, today. I can't see him, but um, he's here. He gave a tour of the gallery at 12. There'll be other tours later by a museum educator. And this exhibition, which closes in early December, um, is uh, really a, an amazing look at not just the work of one person, but of a whole time and place uh, in, in American, in, in, in New York history and American history. Uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't have done this festival without the generous support of the Dalio Philanthropies. So I'd like to extend an enormous thank you to them. And I'd also like to thank um, the whole McDara family, um, as well as Peter Barbie. Um, we really uh, appreciate all your contributions. Uh, so I now I'm going to ask you to please silence anything on you that makes noise, but feel free to tweet and Instagram away with our uh, hashtag vibe of the village. And I'm now going to introduce our distinguished moderator, Vince Aletti, and he's going to in turn introduce the four photojournalists. Vince was the art editor at the Village Voice from 1994 to 2005 and the paper's photo critic for 20 years. Following a stint reviewing photography exhibitions at the New Yorker from 2005 to 16, he covers photography books for Photograph and writes a monthly column called This Is Not a Fashion Photograph for Italian Vogue. He contributes to Aperture, Art Forum, 
luncheon, appartamento, and Aledi won the 2005 International Center for Photography's Infinity Award for writing. So won't you please join me in giving a warm welcome to Vince Aledi and our panel. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Uh, if at any point you can't hear me well, please just raise your hand or make noise. I think all of us have a very complicated relationship with the Village Voice. Uh, I certainly, I was a reader long before I was a writer there. Uh, I remember picking up the Village Voice in college, and when I came to New York in 1968, I bought it every week. Um, I also sold it at uh, Ed Sanders' Peaceye Bookstore, where I worked at, uh, in, on Avenue A. Uh, and before I wrote for The Voice, I was a writer about music for The Rat, another alternative uh, weekly in New York uh, on actually with offices on 14th Street. Um, and I went to The Voice as a writer, or I wrote at The Voice for freelance in the 70s, starting most working mostly at, at the beginning with Bob Criscow, and then with Richard Goldstein as my editors, uh, both of whom taught me to edit uh, more than I, uh, and I'm really grateful to both of them. I, I learned editing by working with them. Um, and I started um, editing at The Voice um, in the mid-'80s when I took over uh, what had become, what was initially called Centerfold from Guy Trebay uh, and became the Choices section. The, the, um, and which kind of gave me the, the opportunity to work with many of the photographers at the paper. Uh, to, there's always a large photo as, as part of the, that centerfold and a part of the choices activity. And at the same time, uh, around that same time, I started writing about photography. Uh, actually taking over from Fred McDara, who had been for the longest time um, the writer for the choices section, or for Centerfold at that point, uh, who had reviewed photo shows. Um, and was kind of getting, I think, a little tired of it. Uh, and when he moved on, I was happy to sort of take over that spot, reviewing exhibitions in New York. Um, at the same time, I was writing about music for The Voice. I had a column called The Single Life about singles. I had a column about music video. One of the great things about The Voice, I think, for many of us was that it gave us the chance to move through different areas as we were kind of excited about something. Uh, it gave us a chance to follow our enthusiasms. Um, so I started there as a music writer. I became a photo critic, uh, little by little. Um, and I think that's I wrote about books, I wrote about film. I, I, I think The Voice was unique in that way, that it really gave a lot of us the opportunity to move through various departments. Um, and sometime in the early 90s, I became the art editor. Um, and it, that gave me the chance to work with first Peter Sheldahl, uh, Kim Levin, and then I, later I hired Jerry Saltz. Uh, but mainly I worked there with Robin Holland, who was a terrific photographer and photographed all the art uh, installations, galleries. She was really this reliable uh, and terrific uh, source for all the, the pages that, that we did in the art section. Uh, but I also ended up working really regularly with 
Sylvia uh, Plahi as the, when she photographed for Guy Trebay's section, which, uh, or page, which I edited for some time. Uh, I edited Michael Musto for a number of years, and his main photographer was Kathy McGann. So we all, as editors, had really interesting relationships with our writers and their photographers. Uh, and it became, I think, really an important part of the experience there. Um, I left the paper in 2005, after most of my friends had either left or been fired. Um, it was a, not a good time at the paper. Um, within two weeks after my leaving, every other arts editor had been fired. Um, it was, you know, I, I left what was clearly a sinking ship. I'm glad it continued in various forms after that. Um, but again, it was a long and complicated relationship and one I'm really glad I had. Um, so, but now we're going to talk about photography. Uh, and uh, we're starting with Harvey Wang. Uh, let me do a quick introduction of him. Harvey Wang has published six books of photography, most recently From Dark Room to Daylight in 2015. Wang has, has exhibited at museums, including the National Museum of American History at the, at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., the New York Historical Society, and the Museum of City of New York. His short film about the photographer Milton Rogovin won the prize for best documentary short in the Tribeca Film Festival. Wang worked as a photographer at the Village Voice under Fred McDara. And I think uh, of this group, he's the, the one who worked most closely with Fred. Okay, so, <clears throat> wow, so nice to see everybody and um, to be with such distinguished photographers. Um, I was going to, um, um, I was going to, yeah, okay, yes, okay. Um, I, I put this up because, um, all right, so when I was um, a, a freshman in college, I, I was a Village Voice uh, reader through high school and it was a great a pleasure of mine growing up in Queens to get this kind of newspaper about uh, what was happening in places I'd rather be. And um, um, when, I went, when I went to, um, I, I became a newspaper photographer in high school, went to college, and in my freshman year of college, I, I, w I decided I wanted to become, work for a newspaper, and I wrote letters to um, uh, all of the photo editors, and the only one who responded was Fred McDara. Um, so at the age of 18, I worked, uh, he offered me a summer job, three days a week uh, to, uh, for $20, uh, <laughs> A weekly salary um, to work in his house and help him do one of his um, commercial projects. It was a book called the Photo Photo Photography Marketplace, and my job was to clip yellow page. He, he had all ordered all these yellow pages from around the country, and we were cutting out uh, hotels and uh, photo labs. And he was going to compile this book. This is pre-internet, so this was a useful resource to have a book. You know, I, I'm going to Indiana, where, where am I going to get film? So he, that's, a, that's what the book was about. Um, but I got to, every day I got to eat a tuna sandwich that he made, and I, <laughs> I, I sat with Gloria at the dining room table, and we, we ate. And uh, He let me come on some assignments, and it was very, very heady and exciting for me um, to be, you know, see this world of real photojournalism. Um, and... Uh, <coughs> I, on my own, this is the first picture I ever published in The Voice when I was 18 years old. It's the one of the clown, the clown artist. It's right under a Joseph Boyd's picture, so. Oh, no, we'll see. there we go. Okay, so um, I should have, this, this should have been up the whole time. So the picture of the uh, clown artist was at the Washington Square Art Festival that goes on there, and I, on my own, I went and I took pictures, and, and remarkably, Fred was able to get it in the paper. It's underneath the Joseph Boys, so it's like high art and low art. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and there I am. Uh, and I, I can't tell you what it meant to have, see my byline in The Voice at that point. It, 
it meant so much. It was so exciting. I, I could, I would, I, 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 walking by the newsstand and seeing it, and it was just such, it was one of the biggest thrills of my life as a photographer. So that's why that's there. Um, it, I, um, so that was in 1974. Um, when I graduated college, I uh, got in touch with Fred, and he uh, said that they had this intern. They were starting this internship program. I think I was the first intern um, in 1977. And um, am I first or second? I don't know. I, I always, people tell me I was the first, but. Um, Go with it. <laughs> <laughs> So I, 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 I was the first voice intern, and, and I, at that point, um, Sylvia was there as, I, you hadn't even, you would think you were photo researcher first, and you had just, you were. I was photo Also speaking to your mic. Uh, yeah. Oh, I was, no, I was working both as a photographer and working in the office. Right, so I, so I was there at that point, and, and George Del Merico was the art director who was really important in my life, and I know, it, James is, is James um, had an incredible um, working relationship with George, and th this was one of the assignments. I did a lot of assignments with Arthur Bell, and um, this picture was from the um, when the Warriors film was released, and uh, Mar this is Marcelo Sanchez, and I got to go with him to the Bronx to a, a premiere and it was, hang out with him on the subway. Um, in the period I was there, um, there was we, we covered politics, music, whatever. There was no, I didn't have any particular uh, thing that I was doing. Uh, this was uh, Ed Koch campaigning um, for uh, mayor, and it's, it's a typically great George Delmerico layout um, where you know he, he finds a picture and knows how to feature it. Um, Another Arthur Bell assignment, we, I, it's weird, I, I went to um, two Catskill Borschfeld hotels with Arthur Bell. Um, we had you, separate rooms. You should tell a little, just quickly, Arthur Bell was a regular columnist for the paper for a long time, covering film, uh, but also one of the first to cover sort of the gay LGBT beat, uh, and was very important at the paper. Yeah, uh, but but he also covered yeah. Jewish singles in the Bo in, <laughs> in, in the Borscht Belt. So I, I, I went with to Con the Concord Hotel on a July Fourth Singles Weekend, and also another occasion we went to Grossinger's together. Um, um, but you know, in terms of like the cover, the wide ability to shoot anything. Uh, this was the uh, Reggie Jackson in Yankee Stadium, the old Yankee Stadium. Um, when uh, Son of Sam was captured, I was outside the courthouse, the um, the court where he was arraigned, and this was the next day. And it was a great relief in the city when he was captured. Um, uh, this is also from the Warriors' uh, premiere up in the Bronx, and I think this is my last picture. So this is Fred McDara uh, huddled with. Um, uh, there are three interns in this picture, and Wes Goodwin. Wes Goodwin was the, uh, Peggy was he a? Uh, art associate, art associate art director. So it goes from um, my left to right is Doug Van, Wes Goodwin, there's Fred, um, Alice Gar Garrick, and Debbie Feingold. So just a scene in the voice. Um, and I think uh, that's, that's uh, like the pictures I'm gonna show and I'll, I'll pass. But you don't need to. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me introduce you, Sylvia. Uh, Sylvia Plahi had a 30-year tenure as staff photographer for The Village Voice. Her weekly column, Unguided Tour, which became the title of her first book, won International Center for Photography's Infinity Award in 1990. She's had other photo columns in Metropolis Magazine, The New Yorker, Aperture Magazine, and The New York Times. Her awards include the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship, Dr. Eric Salomon Prize for Lifetime Achievement in Photojournalism, and the Lucy Award. Sylvia. Thank you. Thank you. It's very nice to be here with you, all of you. Hi. And all of you. <laughs> 
I, I kind of recognize the gray hairs. And <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting how, how old my audience has become. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't, of course. <laughs> um, so I came to the Village Voice with Clay Falker, who, who bought the voice in around 1974, I believe, 73, late 73, 74. And because I used to work for him at the Herald Tribune and then later at New York Magazine, um, he invited me to come there and do some photo editing, photo research, and, um, and I said I will only come if I can do one picture a week also. And so he agreed. And, uh, and that, that was my, my entrance in 1974, uh, a year after my son was born. And uh, it was a wonderful time because we started, I, I knew the first art director was Gil Eisner. And, um, and so there was Gil Eisner, there was Peggy Goodman, who worked also in the art department, and later Bob Eisner, Gil's brother, took over the art direction. And, um, and we had, uh, there was a, a lot of new people, because Clay Falker bought the Village Voice, and he wanted to make it more like a magazine, and he was a proponent of personal journalism, which he did in, the, in New York Magazine. So I, I always had a sense that we could kind of express whatever way we wanted to photograph, which existed before, and it existed during previously too, but this was more, he wanted it to, to have a more of a look of a magazine. Um, so is this, let me show a picture anyway. Uh, so I, I went on and on, and um, I loved being there because it was a, some of the old crowd was there, and, uh, and there were new people, and everybody was excited to start a new thing and start together. And uh, in 1977, when you were the first <laughs> <laughs> intern, was also a big year for me, because I got a Guggenheim Fellowship. So getting a Guggenheim gave me, the, gave me an edge. So I, I asked Mar Marion Partridge, who was the editor then, if, if uh, that I would like to come back after my Guggenheim as a staff photographer. And I was second staff photographer <laughs> because James was already a staff photographer. But in 1977, they made me staff photographer, and then I could give up my day job. And um, so I... I, but all along, I, I worked with, it was a wonderful place because I worked with this first one, the first slide is, is about the uh, Crown Heights riot that Gray, Gray and I did together. Guy and I were a team. He had a column and I was mostly his partner in crime and taking the pictures for his column. And before that, I did a lot of work for him at the centerfold. And um, so we rushed to, to Cran Heights when we found out about it. And we, I happened to be at The Voice. And, um, and I pulled out this article for, to get prepared. And I, I got totally engrossed and, and stunned by how good a writing it was. Um, I, I, I actually cried. I don't know if I cried because I, I'm becoming old and nostalgic about my life, but, <laughs> but I think it was, it's, it's a brilliant article and it makes me a little sad that I don't know if you can ever find these articles. Can you find them anywhere? Well, because <coughs> nobody kept a record of the Village Voice, um, not I thought. Well, Guy published a lot of his pieces in, in books separately, so I no, don't know but whether not this, this particular. I think he published. I know about one book anyway. Mostly but columns. He has another one. <coughs> okay, I I was just saddened that that some of this writing is not available. But well, I'm also I was happy that you chose this because 
one of the things I encouraged everyone to do was to show tear sheets uh, so that you have some sense of how these pictures appeared in the paper and the context that they were seen in, uh, the topography, the design, and everything. So I'm really happy that you pulled this out. So, so we, it, was, it was a rare event because it was, uh, but, but I'm not going to tell the whole story. You probably heard about it. And uh, it was very, very dangerous, and people were throwing bottles from the roofs. And, and a, a, a hair salon woman who, who uh, a lady invited us in and pulled the shutters down, and I took this picture through the shutter because to be out there and to be a white person at that moment was not a good thing. I went back the next few days, and, and luckily, because The Voice was a weekly paper, it had the advantage of, of, being, of having a little time to think about what, what, mm. what you did, to really look at <coughs> your pictures. The deal was is that we all developed our own pictures. We all brought in the contact sheets or just the prints sometimes, because there was no time. And, um, and so we had a week to, to kind of call together things and come back and forth to the voice if there was time. But we, were, we also had a lot of freedom in choosing what we were to show them. Mm. So let me go on. This is, I did a lot of portraits and a lot of, I worked with a lot of wonderful other people, um, writers, uh, I, I have uh, still lots of connection with but this is Almodovar. Yep. Pedro Alm Almodovar, the <laughs> Spanish film director. And uh, so I, I photographed some, some famous people. And, and the 80s and the 90s, they were, I really liked those famous people. <laughs> <laughs> and then we did a story about, a guy was one of, I worked with a lot. Um, Anna Mayo was another person I worked a lot with, uh, Jim Ridgway, and there were many, uh, Laurie Stone, and... Uh, but Guy could do sort of anything. What? So uh, Guy could do anything in the city. He yes. had sort of a really open brief. Uh, so I'm, the idea that you were photographing... Uh, the Central Park Zoo. Yeah, the Central Park Zoo <laughs> yeah. was... <laughs> And Gus and Ida were the names of those bears. I'm very bad at names, but I remember <laughs> animals. <laughs> <laughs> they were new there, and they 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 were they they loved each other. They never got it on because they were never had experience before, <laughs> and they came from different zoos. And but they were lifetime pals. Um, and this one, I, we also did the international stories. We went, I went to, with Guy to Kuwait. Uh, Paul Berman went to Nicaragua, and I went afterwards to Nicaragua. This picture is from Nicaragua. When, when I went there a week or two after he did the article, and um, I stayed in a, in a hut in, in the village while the other journalists from Time magazine and, and New York Times and Newsweek and all that were staying at a fancy hotel because we were the village voice. <laughs> uh, we were kind of proud of it, <laughs> part of the poor relative. <laughs> and anyway, I was there and I, I would walk all the way to the place where they, the, uh, the other, the fancier journalists were staying and hung out with them and at night I would come home, walk back to the village. And, and some women actually walked me home on the street because they saw me walking around with the camera and being a foreigner, and they said, let, let us walk you home. So they were lovely. I had a very good time. And um, I also met Susan Mizellas there, and we, she, she took me with her on a trip, and her car broke down, we hitchhiked. <coughs> and we got to the border where this was taken at the border of Nicaragua and... Um, near El Salvador and no man's land where people who have been separated due to the war and being on opposite sides or families that had people who had to leave the country, they came there for a weekend. 
and they walked there with chickens, and everything. Most people just walked for miles. And this is a couple, and they played music, and they found each other, and that's what that was. Mm -hmm. Then the most of my pictures were taken in New York. Um, this is Jean Michel and around Basquiat. The corner. Basquiat. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I do know him. <laughs> <laughs> I even remember his name. Um, anyway, he he was living around the corner from the Village Voice on University, not University Place, oh. on, on the Bowery. Oh. He he was right there. I had an appointment. I went in there, nobody was there. I sat down, he finally came down from upstairs and he came down like this and his painting was up on the wall. I set up lights, sometimes I was in the lighting mood. And, um, and he came there and he su suggested he'll put on a shirt. I said, no, no, don't bother. <laughs> 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 and I'm glad he didn't. <laughs> and I think he's glad too. On the other hand, <coughs> that picture was asked, someone asked me nowadays, recently, to use the picture in a, an exhibition of his, and uh, I was about to let them use it and put it up there, and, and then they got word from the, who is the group that is the estate. Estate, the estate, yeah. that they don't want naked pictures of him. What? See naked. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, so yeah. I, I didn't, maybe there was another reason, but mm -hmm. that was the reason I did. And <coughs> this, is, this is almost the last, I, I cheated. We were allowed to take seven pictures, but Heidi picked seven pictures from 30 years of being at one place, <laughs> when you photographed every day. I mean, how do you do that? I left out <laughs> my favorite pictures, but here is some. <laughs> <laughs> so this was two pictures of the World Trade Center in 1983, the first picture, they were rebuilding the whole, uh, the bar, or the whatever that area the is called. Battery Park City, yeah. Battery Park but, yeah. City. They were putting up all these skyscrapers uh, 10 years after the World Trade Center went up in 73. And I ha there were art shows there. And it was called Art on the Beach. And this was, I went to photograph a performance by children and uh, on the beach, but while I was there, I noticed these shoes on a sand dune mm. that somebody put as what their artwork. <coughs> and it was, it was very, fra very startling to me to see the World Trade Center bright and shiny alone, like a torch standing there, and these shoes thrown there as if obviously discarded and, and dead. And, and so I took that picture and then I never used it because you see I made a mistake with it. There's a streak on the top. When I developed the film, I didn't agitate enough and there's a streak. So there's a streak going up in the top part of it. And so it wasn't perfect, I never showed it to anyone. And then it happened. The World Trade Center fell down, it was horrible. And I, I was heading down toward it, and, and I was in Manhattan at the time, so I, I could go toward it. Everybody was leaving and running back with white stuff on their face. And I was completely stunned, and I couldn't take too many pictures. But then I saw two shoes on the ground, and, and, and I remembered the other shoes. And that's the, s the, the, the former building is, is in the background. And then I looked at the old picture, I pulled it out. And the old picture, I date my pictures, uh, they're filed by date, and it was taken in 1903, 9-11. Can you imagine no. that? Really? That's a stunning thing. <coughs> so that's, that's my big story, and this, this is to show you, this was at Three Mile Island, I didn't go there. Yeah. Oh, oh just got, got an extra. I was not doing it. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, so this is a horse. I call it Nightmare. <laughs> it was a horse who was made. I happened to be in Three Mile Island to photograph 
a few months after, or a year after, I think, or a su almost a year after the accident, and uh, for, for two articles called Cowan and Anna Mayo. Anna Mayo did a story on the animals, that there were a lot of um, miscarriages for among the animals after the fallout. Anyway, I followed a veterinarian, and I ended up in this place where a racehorse was being made to swim after his night of racing. And I, the horse was very exhausted and very much in a turmoil, and I like animals. I don't know his name. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this That's all right. But he, he, he was swimming and he was struggling, and that picture kind of, I usually call it my self-portrait. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I consider myself. An appropriate place to end on that. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Next is James Hamilton. Uh, James Hamilton began his career in 1969 as the staff photographer for Crawdaddy, a uh, music paper. Uh, since then, he has held staff positions of the Village Voice, Harp the Herald, Harper's Bazaar, and the New York Observer. Hamilton has worked on assignment for many magazines, including New York Magazine, the New York Times Magazine, and Rolling Stone, and has photographed film stills on set with directors George Romero, Francis Ford Coppola, Bill Paxton, Wes Anderson, Noah Baumbach, and many others producing film stills. James. Hi. Take Thanks it away. for doing this, Thank by you. the way. And it's so great to see you guys. Yeah, These photographers never yeah. seem to get together. It's not on. You know, hello. Speak, speak more into it. Hello, hello. Yes. yes. Okay. Do I have to say it again? <laughs> uh, photographers never seem to get together. So <laughs> when we do, we have to go out to Queens. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, Amy you lives around the corner. <laughs> Amy lives around the corner, but I never see her. Um, I, have to, I have to give a brief history. Well, first of all, I want to say that if there were five of us, the fifth Beatle would be um, Catherine McGann, who worked there for 16 years, covering nightlife, and did fantastic work. <coughs> it was always fun, really livened up the paper. Um, uh, I have to run through a brief history because it's, uh, some part of it is relevant. Uh, as Vince said, the, my first job was at a newspaper called Crawdad. It was a rock and roll paper. In, in one form or another, it actually preceded Rolling Stone as a rock and roll paper. It's begun by a guy named Paul Williams. Um, so I wound up uh, hired there as staff photographer. And the art director was a guy named Gil Eisner, um, who wound up hiring, well, me oh. anyway. You worked with you worked with Gil, yeah. Who wound up uh, being an art director at The Voice, um, and also uh, uh, Vince mentioned, might have mentioned I began at Pratt. I was studying painting there, and I had a, uh, became friendly with a guy named George Delmerico, who also figured largely in my life later because he. I had five staff positions. My uh, after the rock and roll paper. There was a paper called The Herald, and the first hires were George Delmerico and me. And I hadn't seen George for years, but he had been the art director at New York Magazine. Um, so he was brought in, and I was brought in as staff photographer there. So we worked together there, together there for a few years, and, um, and then I got hired away by Harper's Bazaar and had a long relationship with an art director called Bea Feitler. So art directors figured very largely in my life. Um, very influential, very um, uh, significant people in my life. And um, so after uh, Harper's Bazaar, I was between jobs. They actually, Bea Feidler had created the position of staff photographer uh, and I um, held that for a while and then Bea left and somebody else came in and they decided they didn't want a staff photographer anymore, so I was out of a job. So I wound up working, selling records at Bleaker Bob's. <laughs> 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 on Bleaker Street. 
Uh, he, said, he said that I was the worst salesman he ever had. <laughs> because all I did was uh, pilfer singles and take pictures. Um, but we got, along very, I, uh, we got along very well, and I really loved the guy. Um, and then, um, and then uh, I got, uh, Gil Eisner had, as I mentioned, had gone on to The Voice, so he asked me to work there. So I began a almost 20 year career uh, at The Voice. Um, so this picture, this is, uh, I, uh, Joe Kahn is, I had great relationships with writers. At least two are here, uh, Mark Jacobson and Kathy Doby, uh, both of whom I met on stories. Kathy Doby uh, I met in 1989 on a story, and uh, we've been partners since then. Uh, so boy, it's been very good to me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Mark Jacobson and I did uh, lots of stories where they, uh, I'm getting distracted from this story, but I have to say <laughs> that we had an amazing editor there named Mar Marianne Partridge, who basically said to Mark and I, take off. So she gave us a car and we drove across the country picking up stories all across. No plans, no anything. We just ran with it and came back with these really fun stories. And, um, uh, and then and George Del Merico uh, was the art director by then and uh, George never cropped one of my pictures. And I was very, I was very, uh, happy about that, because <laughs> I don't think anyone loved <laughs> photography more than George, um, <coughs> except maybe BFI. But, but um, so it was a very happy experience working with somebody who adored photography as much. He brought Amy in um, and just treated us royally, I would say. Um, and his sister is here today. Um, so, so, this picture. Yes, this picture, sorry. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, it's easy for me to get distracted. Joe Connison, another writer that I worked with. I work with basically three uh, writers mostly. I work with Mark Jacobson, Joe Connison, and Michael Daly. Joe Connison, who actually happens to be in this picture, he's in the background. Uh, he's the only figure you can see way back there. Um, and I uh, bluffed our way into a convention in Las Vegas. The Voice sent, sent us to Las Vegas in those days. Uh, and it was the Teamsters convention. And that happens to be Jackie Presser being hauled in um, at an opportune moment for me. And we totally uh, bluffed our way into it by pretending we were uh, photographers working for the union. Because uh, there, there was no press there at all. So I was very lucky to get this. Um, and uh, it actually, a lot of unions contacted us about this picture because it, uh, I guess it was a, significant picture for them. <laughs> this was, I was having uh, dinner at uh, Karen Durbin's house, um, who was a writer, editor at the paper, and uh, with a bunch of other, there were some other voice people, uh, Richard Goldstein was there, a few people, and uh, somebody said that there was gonna be some action in the East Village, and there sure was. There were, uh, this was uh, known later as the Tompkins Square police riot, because there were hundreds of cops there. Um, and uh, <laughs> it was un un an unnecessary uh <laughs> uh, use of police force. There were helicopters, horses, and hundreds of cops. And uh, so I caught this picture. Uh, this was, this was very early. Uh, Gil Eisner was still the art director there. And uh, it was a Monday night, which was deadline night. And I had to run up to a hotel. We, I, most of my pictures, uh, most of my portraits were taken in hotels. If, if it wasn't a hotel, it was maybe on the street or in my apartment where I actually had a seamless and I would do portrait, a lot of portraits there. A um, lot of rap, rap people went up my, came up my stairs to take pictures. I lived on University Place, which was about a half a block from The Voice. Uh, 
Actually, I lived there before the voice movement was there. So I would roll out of bed to deliver pictures. So I, I had to get this picture done that night. And uh, I, I spent really... What was the piece, what was the picture for? Like the what, who, what, it was somebody's, somebody did an interview. Oh, okay. I can't remember who it was. Yeah. It wasn't, it, it was a freelancer. Um, so, um, but we actually, in those days, uh, we're talking about the 70s and into the 80s, uh, you could spend hours with somebody, uh, and that all changed in the 90s and the, and the 2000s uh, because they, would tur they turned into press junkets where you would have like 10 minutes with somebody at the most, and uh, they would haul you in, shove you out, kind of thing, and there were always handlers everywhere. This was just, you know, Jack opened the door, and <laughs> we walked in and spent two hours talking with him on af this afternoon. And... So I took a bunch of pictures, and we had a really nice time. And he was brilliant and funny and everything. And, um, and then as I was leaving, I realized they didn't have a close-up for the cover, so because um, I knew they wanted one. And so I was literally at the door on my way out. And I lifted my camera, and he just picked up a clipping. This was totally his idea. And, um, <laughs> and that was that. This was a story I did with uh, Arthur Bell. Um, again, it was like we had access to Muhammad Ali for three, three or four days. I can't remember. But we just wandered all over town with um, Ali up in Harlem, all over, really, all over town. And everywhere he went, of course, the world's most famous man, everyone adored him. So it was, it was terrific. Um, and so part of the trip was to go on this uh, midday talk show and uh, caught this. <laughs> this is Jerry Lewis. Um, th it's a, I, I think this is a disturbing picture in all kinds of ways. Um, <laughs> but it happened and um, and uh, it, it's just so was strange that it all happened right in front of me that all, there were all these elements. The TV set, him dressed as a clown, the kid holding his pants, the mother, uh, and it was uh, basically a, a um, <coughs> promotional thing that he was doing. He was doing for, a, for his telethon. And I uh, actually didn't shoot it for The Voice, but it wound up later on a, on a doing as a profile picture of Jerry Lewis. Um, but I know it, it even disturbs me a little bit. Um, there's another one. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a story that Kathy Doby did. Uh, I, I, I went with her on several stories, but not this one. She had already done the piece. And, um, and I, so I went later on. This is in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, which is you know, a center for white power racists, and this was at a um, commu uh, compound there. And uh, I didn't, I, I really wanted to, believe it or not, be kind of neutral uh, and, and let them um, do what they wanted to do. And it winds up almost being a poster, either for or against what, what they were up to. And um, they were just standing there, because I love the background. And, um, and I said, do what you want to do, and that's what they did. Um, and it ran, it actually ran pretty big in the paper, and it's, um, it's also, as I say, kind of disturbing, but. Um, and then this was, uh, I wanted to show a street picture, so-called street picture. Um, and I, I was doing a story about uh, the Upper West Side, and I, I it turns out that, I, an enormous number of pictures that I had taken over the years were of kids. Um, and I didn't even realize until I was been archiving and looking at pictures. Um, and this, this I, 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 I like this as a street picture because um, it says a lot about the street. It's, it's spontaneous. I had no idea this kid was gonna do that. It was a reaction to my camera. Um, and it was, uh, as, I, as I mentioned to Vince, it was a very violent time in the city. It was mid-70s. And um, 
and it, in a, in a way, it shocked me. And in a way, it didn't because this was this was kind of what the streets were like in those days. It was a very violent place, I thought. And so, for me to lift my camera and him to react exactly this way at exactly that <laughs> moment was, uh, I don't know, strong picture to me. Alarming. Uh, uh, alarming. Yeah, alarming. <laughs> Thank you. Amy Arvid. Um, next uh, is Amy Arbus. Amy Arbus has published five books, including the award-winning On the Street, 1980-1990, a compilation of her monthly fashion features in the Village Voice by the same name, and most recently, After Images in 2013. Her photographs are, have appeared in over 100 periodicals throughout the world, including New York Magazine, and people. Arbus has had 36 solo exhibitions, and her photographs are in the collection of the National Theater of Norway, the New York Public Library, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Amy. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? <laughs> I was born and raised in, in the village, so for me, it was the voice was like the Bible. Uh, everybody read The Voice. You know how everybody reads The New Yorker? That's how it was with The Voice. But it wasn't until I was assisting a fashion photographer learning after once, one year in school at the Museum of Fine Art, I went to work for Jean Pagliuso, and I was with her for two years until I got the job at The Village Voice. And initially, it was on speculation. You know, there was no money involved, but it was, I was offered on the street without knowing really what it was. So I had three months to try and figure out what it was, and in retrospect, I was really grateful for the time, because I didn't know, you know, there was no precedent that I was following. So I had to sort of work out how the pictures were going to make sense together. So the fact that I ran into Madonna, who is, I love that she's on the lower left corner instead of getting <laughs> <laughs> um, full coverage. Um, the fact that I ran into her in 1983 on St. Mark's Place and um, I said I was working for The Voice, and she said, oh, um, they're reviewing, that's so weird, my, they're reviewing my first record this week. So um, this, so working for The Voice has completely changed my life. This is my, I am known for this 10 years of work more than anything else I've done in my career. So it was really, really important to me. Um, but working for the style section was both uh, a blessing and a curse. I mean, I could do whatever I wanted, but I was also encouraged by my editor and art director, uh, Mary Peacock, and a different Wes Anderson, um, uh, to find more and more crazy, more punk, more intensely weird fashion. And I was under a lot of pressure to do that. And it's not usually the way your editor pressures, pressures you. Um, in the early days, in the early 80s, we worked together as a team and got to do the layouts together. And then we started adding the captions. And that was super fun for me because I got to call the people that I had photographed and um, actually talk to them about why they were wearing what they wear, were wearing. Um, in 1981, I was walking, I had, was living on the Upper West Side and I was walking downtown to work for The Voice and here was the band The Clash with assorted girlfriends and so on. And I recognized them because I was going 
to hear their music that week. And they were on the set of Martin Scorsese's uh, King of Comedy. They were waiting to be shot. And this was the first time I didn't ask someone to pose for me. I just took the picture. I figured they were busy. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm so happy to have this picture because they were almost entirely cut from the film. <laughs> so don't look for that scene. <coughs> Um, after working for The Voice for 10 years under George Del Marco and Mary, um, she was replaced and I was no longer doing, quote, on the street. Um, so I came up with this idea and I went to Jonathan Larson, who was running the paper at the time, and I said I want to photograph, I want to do a style picture, a style series on the prostitutes because they're wearing these amazing clothes. So we talked about budget and so on. And um, after doing this for five months every weekend from midnight to 4 a.m., Where did uh, you go? Where were, where were the pictures taken? Lick, Lincoln Tunnel. Mostly. What happened was I got in a taxi one night to go from uptown to downtown and I said, do you know where the prostitutes hang out? And he said, oh yeah, right across from my garage. And I paid that guy $100 a night for, you know, every weekend for four months. And I sat in the back of his taxi cab photographing the prostitutes through glass with a lens longer than my arm. Um, and it was, it was thrilling and terrifying at the same time because these were people who could not be photographed legally. So I think it was sort of the most romantic work I'd ever done. I thought the lighting was beautiful. I was developing the film longer than you're supposed to. I would you know, go eat lunch and come back and finish the development process. And, um, and I learned a lot from having dealt with people that didn't want to be photographed and, uh, and understanding why they, and I actually really admired these women, I mean, aside from feeling sorry for them. I think there's one more? No. Um, Were you, because I think you said something about you weren't able to publish most of them, or did you publish most of them in None the books. None were published. None of them. Jonathan was furious at me because um, Jonathan Larson. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because I had spent so much money on this story, and <laughs> and um, and he said, "We love the pictures, but we're not going to publish them. We think they're um, sexist against women." And I had written a piece that was three paragraphs long, mostly about the fact that sex was not what this was about. It was mostly waiting around. It was called The Waiting Game. And I think that he thought that that piece objectified the women. I don't know. I mean, certainly that wasn't what I was going for. And in fact, I was shocked when he said that to a woman. So. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I did, Fred McDara is not the subject of this panel, but uh, since his pictures are here, he is sort of, he's the touchstone, uh, touchstone for us. Uh, and I wanted to just get some sense of, aside from Harvey, who did work closely with him, were, were you, when you were working at The Boys, did you have a sense of his presence, of his legacy, of his legend? He, he was, he was. Hello? Yeah. He was uh, a, a extremely energetic presence. Every time, every time I went to the paper, he was, he was, I never saw him anywhere else but the paper, uh -huh. by the way. I never, uh, even though I think we, uh, we both lived in East Hampton all that time. But, um, 
but he w every time I went there, you felt his presence because he was so ener such an energetic guy. That yeah. was my sense of him too. Although I rarely worked with him, there was this there was this, this kind of energy coming out of the photo department. Yeah. yeah. That that he was definitely in charge of. He he wore jeans and a leather and a brown leather jacket, right? And <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Harvey knows. And when he lots. got excited, he said, "Fucking a." Did he? <laughs> I didn't remember that. I didn't see him that. Uh, he was he was excitable, <laughs> but uh, yes. But uh, but yeah, that's that's what I remember most about Fred. Well, you had the you know you were close most closely with him, but um, but I guess I'm wondering his about the the legacy even after he wasn't there, uh, how much he affected the way you approached your your work, your jobs, if, a, if at all? Well, I'm not sure if, I'm not, <laughs> hello, hello? I'm not yeah. sure if this um, hits exact your question, but I, I um, in, in preparing for today, I, I spoke with, I, I called a bunch of the uh, former people who worked very closely with him, former interns, uh -huh. and he definitely had a, I'm not sure how much his work per se impacted people, but his, way of working, his, uh, he, he was very encouraging to young photographers. He was, um, uh, he pushed everybody to do things, um, explore, you know, what they were interested in doing. He, uh, someone mentioned about, we, we, um, uh, we, we, when we did an assignment, you got to develop your film and bring in a vertical, a horizontal, and then he would say, you can also do one thing that you just really want that's, you know, uh, beyond, Oh. That requirement of a uh. vertical and horizontal. So, he encouraged uh, the young photographers to, you know, push themselves. And um, uh, he had, you know, a lot of peculiar um, habits. Uh, he liked to collect movie stills and organize them in in, in a file. And he, um, um, he he told um, he was always about doing. He didn't put anything off. If if he got mail, he wanted to open it and deal with it. If he if anything. Uh, that's what his energy comes from, I think, was just he was always like busy organizing things and interacting with people. Oh. Um. I remember that he had a f folder of, of dead people. Dead people <laughs> that, that he photographed or? Yeah, when they died, they went into the cell. And they, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he was very organized, That's that I do remember. He, he must have photographed every politician in New York oh. over the years. Yeah. Uh, that's for sure. Because yeah, well, certainly when you see the show upstairs, the, he really covered a lot of ground. Uh, the art, the artistic life of New York, the political life of New York, uh, and was really, and I think really took the sort of the voices mission to heart, uh, covering the, the village but the city at large. Uh, that's the one thing. He, um, he photographed everybody. And he, you know, pre-Getty, Corbis, I mean, he was a photo resource. So the, the, the his work was a, as a commodity, and he he could track a list of everybody he photographed. He would sell the pictures. Um, and um, it, I learned, like, some of the, how commercial he was, how to, oh, how to market. How to make, make, it, make it as a photographer. Right. Um, I'm curious about your experience inside and outside the paper, and how much working at The Voice affected your, the rest of your career, if at all? I'd have to say that uh, I was never luckier than I was at The Voice. I mean, uh, actually, the reason I got hired away from by the New York Observer was because I, I envied what these two guys did, <laughs> which was to have a, uh, a, their own picture. Their own column. Their own column, no. essentially. Regular and uh, so the New York Observer offered me not just one, but two pictures a week that could be anything I wanted, which I did for many, many years. Oh. And uh, one would be on page two, one, and then you, one would be on page four. And so I would have them subtly related. Again, they weren't cropped. So it was, and they ran big. And so I, um, that's because I envied what you guys did. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that was the main reason I left. Was the voice was to do that. Oh. Um, um, but um, it influenced everything, of course, you know, but, but you were spoiled, rotten by the voice because you could, you could really go, 
you know what it was like. You could just do anything you wanted to do, really. Well, uh, you know, my free. sense in thinking about, this, especially s a lot of Sylvia's work, uh, when you were doing um, your column at the beginning, that the format was so all over the place. You could do a panorama, you, sh you could do uh, just a, a whole range of, of approaches. And, and I thought, for me, that was really what the voice was most encouraging about, was the variety of approaches and the idea that you could work in any format. Yeah. And uh, I also that, that it allowed us to have a voice. Have a voice of your own. Yes. Of your the own. voice gave us a voice yeah. and gave everybody who was who was working there for a long time. Not always. There were different editors, yeah. and as as time progressed, it got more and more constricted. But but in in the first ten years, the f maybe the first twenty to fifteen, it was really a lot of freedom, um, and and um, and. And the writers and uh, and everybody who worked there felt that they could give their opinion in the pictures, in the writing, in in what they thought, and had w were part of this whole thing, mm. not just and not we more. And writing. we owned everything we shot. <laughs> what? We owned everything we shot. And we oh. owned everything <laughs> we shot. Uh, of course, we didn't get paid very much. Well, but <laughs> still, <laughs> but it was worth it. Uh. I never worked harder than I did at The Voice. Oh. Uh, that thing of taking the pictures, developing the film, making the contact sheets, making the choices, bringing in many choices so that we could pick from, you know, that that didn't yeah. happen at magazines. Oh. But also, I mean, probably it was rewarding because you were, you had a, a kind of personal investment in, in that, and you were encouraged to be involved. I, yeah. I, and I think that also has to do with owning everything we shot. We, oh. weren't, we weren't treated like hacks, and we didn't have to be. Uh -huh. When I was a staff photographer at Harper's Bazaar, they were shoveling out pictures, throwing pictures away. And uh, okay. <coughs> yes. because they owned them, and they didn't, but they didn't care about them after they ran. Oh. And, and the best thing that, that I, I mean, for me, it was Allowing, uh, I mean, we, we, everybody, every photographer, when they go somewhere, they take other pictures. That is not exactly about the story. So when I got this column one day, when it was, I don't know, I think 1980, when uh, David Schneiderman walked by the office and he said, if somebody's going to do a picture uh, on for the contents page, they can have it. I, I'll give it to them for a while. Oh. And he just walked by and he threw that word out and I said, I'll do it. <laughs> me, me. <laughs> so, well, but but it, all those pictures were, were like unguided tour, which I uh, was wonderful to have a space, just like you went to to leave for for that. Um, it it some of them came from the leftover pictures that you didn't need for yeah, the story. Right. So you were open to the whole world, and it allowed me to see everything. Instead of just zoning in, okay, I'll get into the picture of Basquiat, but I noticed the, the cobblestones on the way. Uh -huh. So <laughs> um, we're running a little over, but I would like to take some questions from the audience. If people have questions, um, please. Um, I think there are uh, microphones around, so if you raise your hand, um, there's someone up front here. Uh, okay, somebody in the back. Hello. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask um, whether you, it's not directed to anyone specifically, but I guess in general, whether you still shoot using film or whether you've uh, kind of gone over to the dark side and start <laughs> shooting uh, digital. Um, I, and, and, if, uh, and just what you think the difference is, you know, in terms of the process and the end product, whether you think there's really a difference and just what your preference is these days. That's a big question, but I, I would say the biggest advantage to digital is not, not buying color film. Uh, color film, which I mean, in my case, I was never really a color photographer, so uh, that was uh, fantastic that I didn't have to buy color film anymore. I still, I still miss shooting uh, with film only because I really like the whole process of processing and, and uh, printing and everything. I still have all my negatives, so I still print, but um, 
it's, it's probably better for the environment if we don't <laughs> use film. Uh, the chemicals are not all that, all that wonderful. But, um, but uh, it's, I, I miss the quality of film, and it's, it's very funny that with digital, that everyone makes such a point of, oh, you can imitate film. Uh, which always seems kind of silly to me, but um, <laughs> but uh, it definitely it definitely was uh, great for somebody who didn't really care about color photography. Can you tell the difference you think between a print? And it, 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 it it's probably getting harder and harder to do that because you can you know there's so many apps where you can imitate <laughs> e any kind of uh, existing film, even film that doesn't exist anymore. I, 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 did, I did my last project w explored this issue. I interviewed 50 photographers, and I, I think that uh, there's still nothing like a handmade print. I mean, once you're looking at things on screens, uh, the differences kind of go away. Um, I know, like James, I maintain a dark room um, uh, for uh, printing old negatives, but um, everybody, any, any work you do nowadays is going to be digital because they want quick delivery. I also, I also miss uh, the, old, the old papers. Um, when I started out, I used Agua Portriga, which uh, Amy's mother used to use, and it just was this gorgeous, rich paper that nothing is el else has come close to. And I don't think you can do that. And I tried to even imitate it digitally, and I can't. Oh, another question? <laughs> oh, just wait until the... Hi, this sort of piggybacks on that question. I'm just <laughs> wondering for each of you, which was your favorite camera to shoot with? <laughs> um, I was working, in my days at The Voice, I was working with a Nikon FM2. It was just a great workhorse. Um, I wanted to piggyback on that question because I feel like the experience of photographing digitally is completely different than the experience of photographing with film. For w the main thing as is that we're, it, it takes away the fear of, oh my God, did I get the shot? Did I expose it right? Did I you, use the right amount of flash? All of that anxiety is now gone. But the disadvantage is that you are constantly seeing what you get and I think you s end up stopping sooner than you would if you didn't know you had the shot. So I think that's a problem. I, I, I'd like to piggyback on your piggyback. Okay. <laughs> and, 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 that I, and that is the, the, one of the real joys of taking pictures was that, taking the picture, not knowing what you got, coming back home, developing it, making the contacts, looking at them, and seeing, oh, that's what I got. In other words, uh, uh, you were, it made you more intuitive in a way because, uh, or at least, at least it realized your intuition because you, you would take a picture and not know exactly what you got necessarily, but you'd find out later what you got. And that, that was, there was a certain thrill to that that has gone probably much. And um, so if you know, you're looking at the picture, you do it over again, you do it over again, um, there is that advantage. But there's a kind of magic that's gone. Well, then I you're totally so agree. you're missing the, the surprise. Absolutely, and the surprise uh, was half of it for me. Uh, you know, as, as I said about that street picture, you know, yeah. the surprise is what's great about photography. You know what interests me is that that kid was acting, in your photograph, yeah. was acting like he had been shot. And we never used that phrase oh. about photography. You would take a picture or you would make a picture, but we never said shoot oh. in those days. Yeah. Yeah. It was a photo session, right. it was a meeting, it was, you know, <laughs> it was all these things, except it, we didn't use that word oh. shoot. Oh. And I'd like to get back to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other questions? Uh, just wait until you get the mic. Um, what I were some of the ultimate contributing factors that really close down the voice. Uh-oh. The, do we know? <laughs> I was long gone. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that ultimately closed down the voice? I, I don't really know, but I'm sure a large, largely it was money. Um, just not having enough to make it go. 
and also the, the factors that are affecting every printed material, every newspaper, every magazine, not enough advertising. Um, I mean, that was what made the voice very, very difficult for a long time. Uh, all the, everything that supported the voice at the beginning, especially all those real <laughs> estate ads, all the sex ads, everything that, f that came b in back of the, the paper, that kept the voice going for years. And when the, once those things died, that, was, that made it very difficult. Um, so there were long periods of time when the paper was you know, just sort of getting by. Uh, and I think in the last few years when new owners came in and took over, they revived it in a good way, but they could never make it, op you know, make it really work. I think it was really, you know, as with most things, it became money. It was I never, never enough. I had heard there were going to be efforts to digitize it, and I had no idea whatever happened to that. Digitize, like put the whole archive online? Yeah, yeah. Supposedly they're doing that, but who's going to pay for that? Oh, good. Good. Thank you. That's the mayor. Yeah. No, I mean, that would be great. But, you know, I would imagine that's also a big undertaking. Um, yes? Uh, hello? Um, in, in the 80s and 90s, I worked as an artist and a curator of exhibitions. And um, the ultimate was to be photographed and written about in The Village Voice. Vince was responsible for some of that <laughs> in my case. But for any artist, whether in the visual arts or dance or music or film, um, that was probably the single biggest megaphone one could get. Um, we, we forget about that. It's before the internet, it's before social media. The voice was really the voice of, of the arts. So I, I want to recognize that. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just I have one more question. Um, blip, 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 blip. Hi. I have a question back here. Okay. Um, I can't see you, but go ahead. I'm here. Hello. Thinking about um, the, the fragility of our sacred newspapers and um, the climate crisis and all of that, uh, and all the onslaught of like digital, so much everyone's making these giant archives. I was curious if anyone had thoughts on like a really good piece of advice about maintaining their own archive and the power of that for future generations and things like that. Oh. Interesting question. You, you mean our personal photo archives? Is that what you mean? Yes, just archives as artists or creators or f photograph archives, yeah. W well, I, 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 um, I, I, I think that if any, if any, if any photographers want their work to live, they should try to get it into archives uh, so they don't stay dark in their basements. No. But I mean, did mo have most of you over the years uh, archived your work in various ways, organized it, um, digitized it? Digitized. Uh, I would imagine that's kind of what you need to do these days. I'm not doing that. Uh, okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> um. I, I, I showed Sylvia a very quick way to do it. Okay. I, I am trying to do it, but, I, I'm, but I'm never going to do it. Sylvia's too prolific it's so to many, ever. It's so many pictures. How do you, I mean, it's worse than picking seven from. <laughs> well. It's impossible. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your attention.